Hello, everyone. We're going to start. Uh, my name is Andres, uh, Andres Hake. I'm the dean of uh, GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University. I mean, for those that are here, you know this, but uh, we have a, an audience, a global audience uh, online, following either now or in the future. So I want to make sure that they know who everyone is. <laughs> But I'm very honored to be uh, celebrating and listening and, and uh, not only welcoming, because you're already part of us, uh, Ilse Wolf, uh, that it's, um, it's also teaching now here and also being connected with many of the things that, that have happened in GSAP during the last uh, years and, and also connected in the, in, the, in the work that is done here through her work and her writing and research. Uh, I first knew about your work in the Chicago Biennial at the time that you presented with Pamphlet, uh, the platform. I, I, know the, I, I love the name Pamphlet Art, Architecture, and Staff, acknowledging the heterogeneous responses and formats by which architecture operates, uh, and, and also art and its connection with many, many other things. And, and there, Pamphlet presented uh, Summer Flowers, uh, an impressive movie uh, that was reflecting and telling the story and constructing uh, the story of uh, Bessie Head's house, rain clouds, uh, and the place in Serom that was built in Serom, uh, Botswana. And that's the place where she wrote the novel, A Question of Power, right? And, and I, uh, when preparing uh, this, I, I was reading this, uh, this poem uh, by Bessie Head, My Home. And there were a few lines that she removed in the second edition that were, my home is a swagger and a shrug. You know, when you get the smack in the face and the pain, the pain don't hurt, you are the master. And all these tensions are there in the house. And not only in the house, but also in the gardens that she was working on while living in the house, uh, the community gardens of Poiteco. Uh, and the gardening, and that's already part of your research with pamphlet, the gardening project would later become a central part of her novel. It was also at this time that South Africa, her country of origin, was undergoing the most extreme and violent destruction of historic black neighborhoods under the Racist Group Areas Act. Bessie Head wrote that she's in mainly concerned with the manner in which the people lost the land. This is a beautiful research that is connecting the house, the garden, inhabiting, daily life, the volunteer and the activist work of gardening uh, in communal gardens and the writing and the sensitivity to what was happening in South Africa at this point. Uh, but this is only one of the works that Pamphlet has been doing, Pamphlet Art, Architecture and Staff. And I would encourage everyone that, don't, that have not been following Pamphlet to, to look uh, at it, and it was, Pamphlet, of course, has been featured in all sorts of platforms, crucial places for architectural discourse, like the Chicago Architecture Biennial in 2019 that I already mentioned, the Center uh, for the Less Good Idea in 2018 in Chimarenga, the Institute of Creative Arts, UCT in 2019, Performa New York in New York in 2020, uh, the, the, the Performa Biennial, and the Publishing Against the Grain. But that's only part of the work that Ilse has been doing, and I, I could keep going and going for hours. She's the author of the 2017 book, Unstischen Rex uh, Two Forum, the story of an African factory, the, factory in, the Dutch factory in Cape Town that became, in the words of uh, Ilse, a factory of identities that could classify people, that could select those that could be incorporated in the modern world and, and exclude others, that could define gender and construct gender through the positions in which people would place to work. And that was something that Ilse relates to the making of modernity. But also it became a place for alternative. It was the alternative to uh, to work in domestic service for a big part of the population, and it was also a place of liberation and emancipation in many other ways, and also a place of empowerment. These complexities are the ones that Ilse work on and the ones that she's reading. She's the co-founder of the transdisciplinary research practice, Open House Architecture, and of course the, the co-director of Wolf Architects in Cape Code, and the work that they've been producing in the realm of architectural design is very known probably for, for most of you. I want to pay or to call your attention on the, the 
Isaac, House Isaac, right? Uh, in 2011, this beautiful 1920s house that could, be, could, could seem very humble, but through the work of Wolf Architects is discovered to be a place of care. And the details of the architecture, even if humble, are incredibly uh, careful. And they show a transmission of knowledge and of care. And uh, as they, they, they uh, narrate, the first thing that the, or one of the first things that the client told you, right, is there is a terrible old building at the back of the site, but we will break it down. <laughs> and your project was very much maintaining it and finding ways to, to keep it and dedicate the efforts to other things, to, and one of them to, to design a beautiful garden that would become part, fundamental part of the house. That's one of the projects that, that Wolf Architects have been developing, and that's an early one, but there's the 66 Great Moore Arts Space Space uh, of Higher Education, a beautiful, beautiful transformation of a school, of an old school into a, an art space. Uh, the, the Somerset College Library, the Brandenburg Hospital, the Cherebota School, a very sophisticated building that it's been broadly published. The beautiful house Yele with this beautiful space on top. Uh, 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 and the studios uh, to the, uh, that were added to the house of Maja and Gerhard Marx. And I'm only mentioning some of the works, the ones that I, I love uh, most uh, among the entire production of Wolf Architects that is very, very extent extensive. Uh, the work of the practice has also been included at international exhibitions, the Venice Architectural Biennial, the Sensen Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism, the Luciana Museum of Modern Art, the Chicago Architectural Biennial, the Sao Paulo. We could go on and on. It's an honor to welcome you here tonight. And I'm very happy to have also Mario Gooden and uh, Lindy Roy that are going to be responding to Alpha. And the work of Mario uh, connects very deeply with the work that Wolf is doing also, operating across media and working in different formats. And, and, and that's also something that is uh, uh, shared with Lindy Roy. And I'm, I'm also very happy that to hear the, the response of Lindy together with Mario. And uh, Lindy has been developing this whole vision of architecture as a neuronal system that is a deep understanding of ecology that is also very connected to the, the work on gardens and nature that, that uh, also it's been operating. So I think this is going to be a very fruitful a conversation very meaningful for, for GSAP and for the entire uh, field of architecture. So all this to welcome Elsa uh, and, to be, uh, and to be very happy that we have this opportunity to celebrate your work. Well, thank you very much, Andres, for that wonderful, generous introduction and full engagement with our work from Cape Town. We work very hard to do things with, that are consequence that um, you know show passion, but show complexity as well. Um, I must also just thank everybody um, for coming and um, hope that you're going to um, enjoy or just be engaged with the kind of stories that we will be that I'll be sharing with you tonight. Um, thank you, Mario. Thank you, Lindy, for also hosting. And also, um, I also want to say thank you to my, my team at home, um, Heinrich Wolf, who I share the practice with. He um, is, is he's going to be, um, you know, being with us from beyond the shores. Um, so this work is a, a combination of a lot of effort from many people and our team in Cape Town. So thank you very much. Can I grab a glass of water? <laughs> The work that I'll be sharing tonight is a few projects that are foundational to our practice. Um, foundational meaning that it is, in a way, the substrate of the architectural production, the, the buildings, the films, the publications, the exhibition designs, the pedagogy, the kind of work that we, um, that we immerse ourselves in in Cape Town. Um, Andres mentioned that we did a lot of research on a factory in Cape Town. Um, this factory is situated very close to my, um, my own house in Salt River, Cape Town. And I used to drive past this factory um, all the time, walk past it as a student. And it in a way haunted me as well to think, what do these buildings mean for, our, for the street? What do the buildings mean for um, us as a society? 
and what do these buildings mean for um, a larger conception of modernity? Obviously, those were not the questions I was looking, thinking when I was just, you know, driving past the building or looking past it. But when I started reading the building as a kind of architectural social landscape, it really became these 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 questions really became apparent to me. I just you just saw me cutting up a room in one of in a space in the. In, in the factory, it was the tea room, and the tea wheel was a very important artifact in the space because the tea wheel would rotate and people would line up and take a cup of tea and move along um, to, the, to the next station. So this was a rotating tea wheel um, that begins to also think about how um, buildings had the kind of arrogance um, to not only um, uh, you know, order people's movements in space, but they were also ordering time because there wasn't a lot of time to have a cup of tea. So that needed to be sped up. All these ideas and thinkings um, are held in a book called Unstitching Rex True Form, the story of an African factory. It is a kind of narrative biography of the building and all the people that kind of are protagonists in the story. Um, I didn't concentrate too much on the architects, um, even though they are a, a, a part of the story. Um, but I started to think through a, the political figures of the day, like for instance, Sissy Ghoul, who was one of the key women um, political activists in Cape Town at the time, and also had a connection with the building in many ways. I interviewed the workers, past and present. I looked at the, um, you know, the archive to try and figure out what these spaces meant for the construction of various kinds of identities. So I mentioned that that project was foundational, but you know, a lot of the projects and a lot of the research projects in the office are continuous projects, so they don't really have an end. They don't really have a kind of a neat conclusion. They kind of almost bleed into each other. They, the kind of questions continue. They go bigger, they go smaller. And one of the projects that um, I'd like to share today is um, a project called A Sound Garden for Bessie Head. It's a continuity, continuous project or continu continuity from the work that we did at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. But it's a thinking about how do we think about homage? How do we think about um, a somebody's work as a writer? But how can that person uh, be seen or read as a spatial practitioner? So Bessie Head once wrote that she was mainly concerned with the manner in which people lost their land. Pamphlet Summer Flowers is in essence a tour of observation that included the gathering of plant material, the pressing of flowers from forced removal sites in Cape Town, a film documenting her house in Seroe, and again a visual and textual handmade publication in honor of her work and her statements on land and dispossession. And thank you, Andres, for also that description of um, the poem of hers at um, my home. And one of the things that Bessie Head did was um, to kind of echo the work that a previous ancestor of ours called Saul Pleike did, which was to think about um, how do you move through the landscape and document exactly how people were dispossessed. And he, this figure of Paul Saul Pleike, he moved up and up to what was then called Beshuana land and which is called today Botswana. And the South African born um, Botswana writer Bessie found Saul Pleike's work when she was researching how people were dispossessed in her part of, of Southern Africa. And really finding Pleike's work was a kind of a revelation for her. And in such a way that she describes, she describes native life as the missing link in the history of Southern Africa. She ended up writing the foreword to the, um, to the, to the republication of, um, of native life. I'm just showing you the publication that we made um, in honor of Bessie Head's work, which documents the, the plant material and a letter that we wrote to the heritage, um, heritage body that proclaimed a house a heritage site. And this is an image of Saul Pleike, um, in essence, writing the book Native Life. But I got interested in Bessie Head by the fact that her house in Seroe was declared, as I mentioned before, a Botswana National Heritage Site. 
I found the plan of a house on the internet drawn by Tom Holzinger, a good friend of hers. And if you have read A Question of Power, one of the characters in the novel, Tom, is entirely based on Tom Holzinger. He also, he also he said it's entirely based on him, except one or two facts, um, including the fact that he was never a, um, a volunteer um, uh, kind of um, a worker um, for, the, uh, for the US government. But um, after Bessie's passing, Tom measured and drew up the plan of the house, partly from memory and partly to supplement the heritage site application. The house was Bessie Head's house from 1969 up until 1986, when Mahedi's yard was used as a gathering space to host a funeral. It is called Rain Clouds, named after When Rain Clouds Gather, a novel from which she was able to make enough money to design and construct this house after living rather precariously in Botswana for nearly five years. So we filmed the we filmed um, me paging through the photographs of Bessie's, um, Bessie Head's uh, garden. Um, and, um, you know, and we found this photo of her dressed in a yellow jersey with knee high socks and photos that we found in the Kama Memorial Museum in Seroe, which itself, the Memorial Museum in Seroe is itself a kind of a shrine to, to Bessie Head's work and a holder of all her letters. Um, so one of the things that Bessie did, in addition to this vast archive of writing, is to write letters. And um, one, one letter, for instance, to Alice Walker, she expresses her thoughts on Walker's new book, Revolutionary Petunias, then very newly published in 1972. And I'm going to read this extract from um, the letter. She goes, I don't know when these notes are ever going to get done, as every now and then I have to stop typing and go and lie down on the floor prostrate with worship. This often happens when one encounters a kindred soul and in the ordinary life is very lonely. I have to spend a lot of time exhausting myself with people who say, but you don't have a word to say. But I don't understand a word you say when all you are really saying is that life is bigger and more beautiful than a narrow world each individual is trapped in. One would keep on saying it doesn't hurt, but I have been feeling it mostly due to that novel of mine, A Question of Power, which draws a lot of shitty comments and people who write delightfully telling me that they have aesthetic backgrounds and the source of my insanity is my rough, crude, slum background. It is one thing to disdain, to reply, another to receive confirmation from some source that one's learning. One's eyes are quite right in saying. So these are the kinds of letters that she was writing to Alice Walker um, in a way to, to react to Alice's new novel, but also to, to say, I'm, I'm struggling. Like, you know, we need to build solidarity as writers. So Bessie's letters are really an extraordinary, are extraordinary because it shows the character of a woman that is just completely badass, completely complex. And the letters give a kind of a full glimpse of the range that is Bessie Head. But to come back to rain clouds, the plan shows a very humble three room um, house surrounded by a generous yard, populated by garden plots with several gooseberry. Leading to the front door is a garden path lined with the same gooseberry bushes. Photos show a simple bagged big bricked um, finished steel um, windows with blue wooden door and a little lintel above the door with a hand carved timber sign that says rain clouds. And I was actually struck by the simplicity and the directness of the house. The plan of rain clouds is, rare, is a rare encounter, perhaps even my only encounter with a space where the arrangement shows the kitchen as the first and only room from which one enters the house. But I'm familiar with entering the house from the kitchen. The house my grandparents were re relocated to in Stellenbosch in the Flakte was through the kitchen. But being placed at the back of the house, we always entered the house then from the back. People that were familiar, family members and close friends would use the kitchen as the entrance. Others like professors, priests, the bosses, um, read the white people, they would enter 
the house from the front room, right? And this room was always very formally prepared. Gladiolus flowers on the table, formal portraits on the elders on the wall, brass ornaments on the tables, all signals that they're there to, to display a kind of a respectability and a respectable family. But what we have in Bessie Head's house is you don't enter through a formal dining room, you just enter straight into the kitchen. And I perceive this is a very intriguing disruption in the conception of how we conceive space and the gestures and performances of formality and familiar, familiarity. This disruption in the conception of space is also captured in an early poem that she wrote, and this is also from the poem that you mentioned, Andres, called Come and See My Home. It's any place where no one gives orders, but tread softly, the walls breathe peace, deep, dark peace, and the wind don't blow. So her description reads like a direct yet foreboding invitation to come inside, partake in the calm and the peace, yet you come with open and responsible consciousness. The plan drawing, the statement from Bessie in the poem, and my own experience of entering similar architectural structures as a child have demanded that Bessie Head and her work as a gardener and homemaker sit squarely into not only the rethinking of our current consciousness of spatial practice, but also provides possibilities of spatial practice as emancipatory. From the outside, the house looks very similar to any of, or even the same as the 51 stroke nine houses that were built for people that were moved to places like Manenberg, Google to Ocean View, and where my grandparents were moved to Klutisvall. But once you enter this house, you realize that rain, rain clouds is a complete new and creative disruption of punitive apartheid council house. And I mentioned earlier the impressive garden that surrounded the house. And Bessie Head, from accounts that I've heard from friends and from reading her literature, she was a prolific gardener and an experimental gardener. There's a photo of her holding a biscuit tin with seeds and her beaming from ear to ear as she smiles into the camera. She wrote letters to Robert Zabukwe, the Pan-Africanist leader, and their exchanges actually only dealt on, on, on gardening. Here is this leader of the Pan-Africanist movement. He's in exile, he's in Robben Island. He's had all these very, very traumatic experiences with the apartheid um, regime. She has had traumatic experience as well, and they write letters about gardening, which is very profound because on the one hand, it shows a kind of a connection that is beyond this kind of struggle for freedom, but it also is a way to connect because at the time, it was very, very common for um, political leaders as letters to be intercepted and to be banned. So they were trying to make a connection through the spatial practice. And apart from a personal garden, Bessie was also part of a collective gardening project called the Boiteco, where the pr principal aim was to grow food for communal use. She made one of her best friends through this communal activity, a woman called Bosele Sianana, who ended up being such a close confidant of Bessie Heads that she organized and led Bessie's funeral in 1986, meaning that according to African tradition, Sianana would be considered a significant family member. The garden then becomes an important site where somebody like Bessie Head, who left South Africa on an exit permit to settle in the strange country with her young son, can form deep friendships. There exists a photo of Bessie and Bosele as two young women in the Boiteco garden. The power of this image made it hard not to choose it, somewhat reworked as a cover of the image for Summer Flowers pamphlet. The garden and the home that she constructs becomes her as a refugee from apartheid, a site where she begins to think from, write from, and where she begins to construct an archive that we are now sitting with and that we can begin to meditate on and think through the life of Bessie Head, her gardening and her, emanci and her emancipatory practice. The house in the garden becomes both a site of liberation for her as well as for others who follow and lead in her legacy. Let me just share some of the images that I found in the archive of Bessie Head and her mother that adopted her. These were some of the um, some of the collages that we were then made from the plant extracts that we um, plant material that we found either at the Seroe House or in forced removal sites in Cape Town and constructed another type of archive. This comes from her house. 
um, this as well, acacia tree, acacia piece. And then we develop a kind of a public program with kids. Well, not a public program, it's just a little workshop with my kids, actually. <laughs> um, sounds very lofty, public program. No, we just played, we played with images and we made these beautiful kids' garden that the children actually made um, in my house. And it was a way for me to transfer some of this work that I was uncovering in the studio with my own children and their friends. Learning from UWC. One of the projects that we were very, um, we were very privileged to participate in and to be um, still party to is to construct or assist the University of the Western Cape to construct an arts school for them in the city. Now, this sounds very simple for an American kind of um, context, but first of all, this University of the Western Cape is a university that was founded on the principle of um, separateness, apartheid. So this university was founded um, for racialized black people, um, and which meant that they only had pedagogy and programs that would be in service for the apartheid state, either as administrators or as um, clerks, teachers, and, and the healthcare. Art was not a consideration as an official pedagogy, neither was music or, um, or, or any of the kind of humanities-based art practices. They had a humanities faculty, but this was definitely in service of training teachers, um, high school teachers. So the University of the Western Cape found a building, we assisted them in finding a building that could be renovated for this particular um, purpose. And what we wanted to do as, an, as a kind of a, um, as, as, as architects, as, as principal agents for this project, we wanted to learn from this university what is the spatial practice, despite the fact that they never had an official school of architecture or, or technicon of architecture, but the practice, the spatial practice was still existing. And we coupled that kind of yearning for a, a learning of how to, um, how to practice um, within a university that was set up in those, in those frames with this painting that was done in 1838 by Charles Doyley. And it is essentially a kind of a very early depiction of the architecture of Cape Town, where you have the official buildings in the background, um, the colonial buildings in the background, but in the foreground, you have a kind of a very unstable and precarious architecture that is around gathering people. Um, it is around some form of commerce, um, people you need to um, enter with respect and humility in this type of architecture. There's somebody that's going to give you a side eye um, and uh, you know you need to build some kind of trust like the person in the middle of the of the tent is looking suspiciously at the other person and there's always people beyond this architecture. So how do we think through this um, new school of architecture with this painting in mind, a kind of a conflation of um, you know, these various architectures and um, um, depictions of space in Cape Town. And this is the building that was um, identified for this purpose. And it is a, a primary school building in Woodstock. But the primary school was on the border of um, the, 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 the kind of fault line for where these group areas um, act was, um, was, was kind of cordoned off. So the landscape in, in Cape Town in South Africa, the Group Areas Act made these borders around racialized um, and racialized neighborhoods. And this one happened to be in the, in the, in the white neighborhood with the Great Moor Street being that physical border where on the other side of the street, it was demarcated for, for black people. So the university being a black university, we really needed to disrupt this kind of apartheid geometry um, by first of all, entering somewhere else, entering, um, uh, you know, the, the entry onto Greatmore Street was a, um, is a kind of a, not universally friendly. I know there's a lot of buildings on campus here where it's with steps and, um, you know, there's a kind of a crisis around how do we reconfigure these buildings to be, make it universally accessible. But this building, we ended up sculpting the courtyard and the foyer 
for this purpose of reconfiguring this building for a, a arts purpose. So you can see that it's a very utilitarian building with a courtyard. It is a typical sort of um, Foucauldian panopticon because the students were all separated by, by gender. The boys had to enter on one, on one um, entrance and the girls had to enter, the girls and the infants had to enter on the other side. Um, so this lobby was also going to have to, you know, uh, disrupt that kind of gender roles. And then the courtyard becomes that kind of space of, of subverting the panopticon. This is a drawing of the, of the, 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 the situation. Um, all the buildings are more or less, um, uh, you know, uh, orientated towards um, each other. Um, and this building is very rare in that it, ori it orientates towards the sea and the harbour on the one side and the mountain on the other side. So it becomes a very rare site in, in, that, in, that, in that space. So what we did, we spent a lot of time thinking about the approach. How do we enter this building? How do we make a garden? How do we make the courtyard? Because the architecture is in a way already there. So the layer that we added was essentially this kind of garden element and this outdoor space. And what you see on the plan is the kind of a new axis that we created to, um, to in a way subvert the, um, the apartheid geography of the fault line on this side. So organizing people to enter into this new lobby area where you can begin to connect the Great Moor um, Street with, with this new courtyard. And then how do you then make this kind of big um, big gesture towards disrupting about its speci specialities. And then the, the public floor is populated with exhibition space, um, public lecture rooms, and but essentially the whole building becomes a kind of a theater space, a performance space, an art space. So on the, on the very lower level, there is a big um, laboratory for the arts, um, because one of the key programs that this new art school will do is to train people in kinetic objects, um, puppetry arts, and also um, linking it to our, one of, some of our famous puppeteers. The Handspring Puppet Company would be a pro, um, will be the mentors for a new puppet company called Ukwanda, and their role is to facilitate a new kind of arts practice through puppetry arts, film and media, um, music, and, um, and theater. And we imagined this space to, um, to be a space of, which is a garden, which is a kind of a transparent space with this new lobby, with um, acoustically sound, and needed to kind of bring in light in a very particular way. We imagined the space to be, um, the courtyard to be weatherproof so that we can get sun in, but also to keep it so that they can use it as a stage. And um, then the lobby becomes this kind of elaborate stair in a way, because the staircase was the device that actually um, divided people. So the lobby becomes the space where people begin to come together with a reading room um, that looks down onto it. And then this is the kind of inside and the sort of um, the way that this axis um, announces itself in the, on the inside. Building is currently under construction. We are on month 28. Um, so we're supposed to be done next week, um, and um, there was some very there was I'm going to share some of the sort of big moments is to put up the roof just so you can get a sense of the kind of location. This was when we were digging down and opening up the lobby, um, and it really getting into the kind of specialities of the courtyard, um, and then you know the how the how the reading room begins to be articulated through echoing some of the arches that were made. And then I'm a mom, so this was a day when I couldn't organize my life properly and get kids from school and drop them off. And, you know, so I just took everybody to site and <laughs> we had to just improvise because Cape Town is a kind of a space where we have to just improvise a lot. So meet my boys, <laughs> two of them. Um, but essentially, we're very excited about this project because the garden is really becoming a kind of a space where it's both a reflective space, it becomes a space of repair, a restoration, social justice, but in a very tangible, intangible, um, you know, way. And we're very, very privileged to have worked with a very dynamic client, very dynamic program who had, has a lot of input in how this building has been imagined as well. So the Center for Humanities Research, our flagship program in the humanities who have really imagined the space in this brief with, with us.
I'm going to quote from Bessie Head um, before I move into the next project. She says, the best way I can explain it is in the words of an industrial millionaire who used his money to conquer the interior of Southern Africa. His main area of conquest, and he waged two wars against the people, was Zimbabwe, which formerly had his name, Rhodesia. When he waged the last war of conquest in 1896, he said, I have taken everything from them but the air. End of quote. And Bessie Head continues, but the problem is more acute in South Africa. You look across the land as a black person and you feel choked. You feel like even the air has been taken because so many vast areas has been reserved for white occupation only. There's nothing there for black people. End of quote. And this is from an interview that Bessie Head did in Australia in 1984. So in mid 2021, we were appointed through a public tender process by the city of Cape Town to develop a conservation management plan for Rhodes Cottage. The scope of the work included writing a statement of significance based on the history of the site, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, a SWOT analysis, an action plan that would cover the management of the site in terms of securing public safety, site conservation, education, and research. In other words, we were awarded the task of outlining how this building should be managed for public use. In, in order to do this task mindfully and creatively, we first had to understand the building and its historic presence for ourselves. We aligned our thinking with the opening epigraph of what Bessie just said, the voice of Bessie Head, and therefore our attitude and approach towards the Rhodes Museum could definitely not be politically neutral. So what we have is a building that is modest, but stately and sea facing, a cottage along the false bay of Cape Town and functions as a house museum dedicated to the life of Cecil John Rhodes. I don't know if anybody of you know who that is, but I'll explain if for those who may not be familiar. But the house in, formed part of Rhodes' very large estate, an estate that once included the University of Cape Town, Grotesquier Manor House, now the South African Presidential Home, Boschendal Farm, and many other very, very big, important gardens, including Kirsten Bosch Gardens. And Rhodes acquired the house as a holiday cottage in 1899 in Musenberg in an area which at the time consisted of a few farms and a number of fishing huts. The timing of Rhodes's purchase and his use of the house coincides with the South African war that unfolded between 1899 and 1902. The war was officially began in October 1899 and in part as a consequence of the failed Jemison raid that instigated by Rhodes and his compatriots in 1885. There was also a camp during the war that um, was set up for people's cooperation. And when the war ended in, in 1902, a few months after Rhodes's death, and despite many, owning many more illustrious and expansive properties in, properties in Cape Town, he chose this relatively humble, um, humble cottage near the Atlantic Ocean because he was ill and because of the access to fresh air which was beneficial for him in order to recover from a lifelong medical condition. He spent his final weeks in the front bedroom of the cottage with an oxygen cylinder by his bed, and the gas was fed to him by a glass funnel held in the front of his face. But he also requested that one of his aides crudely knock a hole through one of the walls of the bedrooms so that the air breeze can go through. So this is a guy that took everything but the air, and then he couldn't breathe. So there are other details of, 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 um, of Rhodes that um, you know, I could expand on, um, on his death, like the fact that when he died, South, the South African government obeyed Rhodes's request that his remains be transported by train from his house to the Matopo Hills, 
a mass of granite hills situated south of Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, over 2,000 kilometers away, and stopping at every major city. I'll come back to that. But in essence, you know, this pilgrimage with the, with the body of Rhodes was done in order so that each major, major city can pay respects to Rhodes. But what we don't really see in, um, in the presentation is, for instance, um, you know, the fact that Yuma Sekela wrote this, or read, um, nowhere in the house do you find, for instance, the song Sissel Rhodes com composed by Yuma Sekela and recorded in 1976, The Colonial Man. Or you don't find the books by Dambutsa Marashera, a Zimbabwean writer who grew up in Rhodesia under Ian Smith's regime and with cutting precision described the colonial situation in black sunlight. In a way, the museum doesn't even make mention of all the major um, disruptions and, um, and, um, and, and, um, and, and student, uh, student um, pro transformative uprisings against Rhodes and his legacy in 2015, in which the Rhodes Must Fall movement happened, in which the, um, the, the statue of Rhodes was, 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 um, was erased, was taken down. So in essence, what we wanted to do with this building is to find out other histories, find out the history of Rhodes, because Rhodes, this history only um, accounts for three years of the site. And we found in the archive that the oldest part of the house is thought to have been built by a fisherman. Um, we found many of the photographs of the house in the museum. The house is really like a stuffy kind of museum for them. But this little image of the fisherman's cottage really gave us a clue to think about the kind of um, other things that could also possibly um, give us light on, on that. So um, what I wanted to also just think about is, and, and, and include in the plan is how can we begin to think otherwise around this history of roads, um, with the fact that, you know, there were Filipino migrants that were also working in the area. There were people from Sierra Leone coming as migrants. There were slave histories. And all these kinds of histories played, played out on the site or surrounded. And what we did with all this information, we put it into our, into our report and we diligently compiled it together with the kind of a maintenance plan, which is very practical about, you know, you have a painting schedule, you have this like a kind of a repair schedule, but together with this um, very practical maintenance plan, we offered the city of Cape Town this other kind of ethic, this other kind of history, and this other way of thinking about the space. And we compiled it in our report. Currently, the building, as I said, is dominated by the history of roads. The building and its site is over 200 years old, and the plan proposed a broader, more inclusive retelling of the history of the site. This history includes the, that of the enslaved persons, working class, black and brown immigrants, and histories beyond the border of South Africa. Our plan and our ethics of engagements was largely approved by the city of Cape Town. They had no issue with it. But the main stakeholder, the Musenberg Historical Conservation Society, I've also called them the Musenberg Hysterical Conservation Society, um, they are the museum curators. They heavily opposed the plan and submitted an 11-page document undermining and contesting the plan on the grounds that its purpose is to delegitimize the property and that roads, Cecil Roach, and to kind of punt for the fact that we want to erase, erase Rhodes's history completely. And I'll quote what they said, um, delegitimized the property and to that Cecil John, I mean their grammar wasn't great guys, sorry, I'm reading it as they said it to me. Delegit I'll try again, delegitimized the property and to that Cecil John Rhodes should be erased completely, dot, 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 or relegated to a dark corner and thoroughly canceled in the most brutal terms. This was the last year, the feedback I got from the society. Um, and then the paragraph on the fact that we wanted to include other histories was viciously anti-white. Um, we were also told that our research on the presence of enslaved, pe enslaved people's histories were emotive. Finally, and here is where I cannot deny that indeed emotionality, this emotionally provoked me when I read this phrase, 
But they were saying that um, the fact that indigenous societies roamed and occupied the landscape um, is irrelevant because they were m mainly ex extirpated by a more um, by a more powerful society. This is what they wrote back to me in 2021. So we were prepared for some pushback, but the extent to which this would reveal certain parts of society's passion for denying historical spatial violence was an unwelcome surprise. It reinforced out our sense that a constant practice of work is required that refuses and questions dominant histories of place and to offer a renewed insights that are both practical, conceptual and imaginative. The engagement re reaffirmed that we should indeed embrace unprofessionalness, because they also call us unprofessional, by the way. And we want to embrace our in unprofessionalness um, and in order to construct these spaces of freedom. So how do we return to a space of breathe breathing? Come and see my home. It's any place where nobody gives orders. Tread softly. The walls breathe peace deep, dark, black peace, and the wind don't blow. This is what Bessie Head says. And currently, the Rhodes Cottage is in service of a, of a museum operations in the memory of Cecil John Rhodes. The history of the buildings on the site could be traced to other fishermen's um, legacies, uh, enslaved people's legacies. The owner of the building, together with the operations and the management team, should embrace these new versions of Rhodes. Instead, they push back. But luckily, we have the kind of authorities and uh, the legal frameworks that support us, um, at least in this, in this instance. Our idea is that this space should actually be returned to a space of breathing, because that is the one thing that is actually the core heritage of the site. So we also then um, propose that the space, which is a very beautiful site, in, in a very beautiful part of, of Cape Town, should be a kind of a space of reflection, reflect a space that is opened up to people that were on the other side of this violent history, and that they should be kind of a um, space of leisure and breathing and workshop and reflection. These are just some of the historical space. And this is a, just an um, a email I got the other day um, from the society. I did not subscribe to this. Um, email link, but they're sending it to me anyway, um, reminding us that Rhodes' birthday is coming up and we should um, do something about it. So this is an ongoing kind of, you know, practice from their side. How do we think about these big issues when it comes to public infrastructure? We were very, again, lucky to be commissioned um, a public school um, and very particular public school, which is a, a school for learners with special educational needs. And these kinds of school are schools that are beyond the mainstream kind of educational framework and have very particular needs. But the clients, provincial government, give you a very, very ordinary brief. They give you a number of classrooms, they give you a number of um, program, and they give you the kind of um, standard list of things that a school needs. So it's a special educational needs school, but the brief is very ordinary. So we had to also then expand the brief. We spoke to um, Joey van Royen, the principal. We were not allowed to speak to her, but um, we ended up just speaking to her to understand what is the requirements. And the requirements, firstly, is that it should be in a site within a context, because very often these buildings are sited, relegated far into a kind of not part of a kind of a material context, um, which stigmatizes these schools in very particular ways. It took us two years to fight for a new site. Um, we came up with all kinds of excuses why the site that the government gave us wasn't appropriate. In the end, we found a very kind of practical um, reason that it's going to be too costly to get rid of underground services. And then they agreed that they need to find another site. Two years of advocacy <laughs> and to get started. So this is the site eventually, which is in a very gentle suburban neighborhood in Cape Town. Um, it has a gentle slope and is integrated with a, a, with a kind of a, a wider community. The plan that we, um, that, we, that we proposed was a very simple, elaborate plan 
which is how do we stack these different classrooms to form a kind of a rival court and then to make a kind of a a rival court that is both out outside and then that is in mirrored or complemented by a big kind of interior assembly space. So what you see in the plan is the kind of void here of the um, of the of the arrival court here um, with the assembly space and then these kinds of rooms that are um, facing each other in between these rooms and this is the kind of thing that we had to almost sneak into the plan are these tall um, and um, tall corridors, which becomes these um, airfold spaces. Because one of the things that we found out in our conversations with Joey is that a lot of these children suffer from respiratory diseases, which a corridor wouldn't actually um, work out, um, would complement, it would actually exasperate that problem. But at the same time, um, we can't have these big open playgrounds, you know, because the playgrounds also um, cause problems of how to contain the groups and how to um, organize, how to allow the teachers to organize the um, the um, the kind of groups in, in in safe ways. The children are very prone to overstimulation, which means that um, any triggers will um, will cause a kind of a havoc that will not allow um, educate or pe the pedagogy to flow. So these um, internal corridors with um, with um, light at each end becomes a kind of a playground. It becomes a place, a space where they can contain um, the, the kids and it's a place where they can have easy surveillance. But also it was a very limited budget. The budget wasn't, um, the budget that was given to us was the exact budget to every single school. So it, I think it was, um, it is a very modest budget. So our materials had to be extremely modest which meant that we then use all our material um, qualities in the kind of um, lower level, which is plaster and brick. And then these corridors become these expressions of um, both kind of architectural, light and, um, and, and tectonic um, expression. So what you see then here is, um, oh, sorry, what you then see is these, um, that's, that is open to the to the arrival court with a big canopy, and I'll show you in the photographs. You have classrooms with no windows to that side, with light coming from the top, and then windows to these corridors. And then these are all on the op open on either side to allow um, air to flow through, but also contains um, the playground so that the children can actually use these areas as a kind of an extension of the classroom that they are in. We made multiple models. The models are for us to advocate for how to um, how how to come within budget, basically. So we, these multiple models are a way to show the the, the clients that um, we actually are stripping away. We try to see how much material we can strip away to still get the exact effect. So we made these models to kind of see the effects of a simple purlin being taken away or you know how how many um, you know uh, which members we can we can save on you know and um, because these corridors um, gets light from the southern light it creates this kind of effect of of um, of very gentle light but also allows um, allows um, uh, air to move through. What we found is that these, these corridors and these play spaces, they really become part of the, the playground, part of the space, but it becomes an enclosed, but also an open space for, for children to play safely. The arrival court um, was very, 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 we were very specific about how to drop off the kids because I don't know if anybody has, or if you must, there must be people who have um, experience with dropping off children at school, but it is a huge mess. You know, nobody follows the rules in terms of where to park, where to do this, where, I mean, in our context um, especially. But in this case, it needed to pay, we needed to pay special attention to it because the um, parents have to um, take the kids physically to the school and get handed over properly by the teacher, which meant that we always had to have this um, very efficient drop-off zone where the pavement becomes a kind of extension and a kind of a stoop to the building and where you park, you park and you drop off and you, you sort of move around in a very efficient way. And this becomes a kind of a court area of the space. What you see in the background is the assembly hall um, and the workshops next to that. 
um, and the assembly hall. But you can see that what we've tried to do is we've used all the money and the material into the kind of bricks down here, and then a kind of a light structure in there to, to really just become to come within budget. Our assembly hall needed to be um, both of a space to, to lift and care for the children, but most importantly, what we found out with our discussions with, um, with the principal is that the people that need even more care are the teachers and the parents, because those are the people who are looking after kids with these special educational needs on a daily basis, and the hall becomes a kind of a homage to that work as well um, in the way that we've, we've articulated it. I think this is the last project that I'll show. What we're thinking about here, in, and especially in the GSAP studio with our students, is this idea of conviviality. And it is a kind of idea of how do we gather, how do we construct the spaces that we gather, how do we consider architecture as participating in those spaces of conviviality, of how do we make, in plain English words, friendly spaces, basically. <laughs> Um, but I love this kind of thinking about uh, Fred Moten and Manolo Call Callahan that conviviality becomes a kind of a mechanism for social cohesion and peacekeeping. So it's within that frame that I would just maybe want to show you um, our house in observatory, which is a, a refurbishment of a Victorian house that we, um, we refurbished and bought nearly 20 years ago. Um, and a very, a very ordinary setting with ordinary neighbors, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to make a space that is both convivial for our family and for our dynamics as a family, but at some points we really like to make this building a public building um, because, you know, we often have, um, you know, kind of open events. Um, we have, um, you know, children's workshops. And how do we, what, what are the kinds of mechanisms that we use to have your house, which is your private space, but at some point it can actually just act in some ways as a as this public space. And one of the things that made me realize that your house could operate like that is when I was started having these children's workshops, children's art workshops, where a friend of a friend of mine and I we started on a Wednesday having these workshops, and then the parents would come to the house, but they won't just drop the kids; they would sit there and do their work like it's a co-working space. Um, and have a coffee. My mom would have to make coffee for people, and you know, it become a public space because you know these workshops are are open. You know, so they expect it to be served as in a public space. You know, <laughs> in my house. So it was a very interesting dynamic that suddenly, yes, your house is now a, a cafe, a co-working space, a, a kind of a, a, another space. But the architecture is open to that, and what we tried to do is we needed to configure this square block as, as various rooms. Um, we made this diagram a long time ago because this is the extension, it's a 10 by 10 cube, and within the cube you have this living room, the outside room, we've got the existing ceilings which are very cellular, but then what brings it all together is this kind of um, rot rotating space, you know, so we went up into the, into the, into the, um, into the, the ceiling to create more space. And then this very sort of, um, you know, curtain wall that, that begins to subtly like make a kind of a boundary. But it, the idea is that it really becomes this kind of continuous, continuous space through the materials that we use, the color of the, of the, of the walls, and the, the, the toilet actually is becoming this disruptor. On the, on the left hand side, you have the existing, oh sorry. Um, this is the plan as when we got it. So this is the existing architecture um, with a kind of a strange little pimple of a, of a room in the courtyard. And this is what we did, where we um, demolished that and demolished that and made this kind of big room that begins to articulate in various ways. Luckily, the building had a kind of a level change, so we could really begin to articulate um, the kind of um, dynamics in volume together with the material. And um, this is a section um, where you can imagine part of the wall just opening up so you can see into the, into the space of, of our, our little modest home with the courtyard. Wait, this, wait, this in Cape Town? Yes, in Cape Town. This is in Cape Town, an observatory. I, I thought it was in New York, I was like, 
really. <laughs> um, no, this is not New York. This is my home in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is the kind of result of that spatial manipulation through light, um, color, and um, and materials. That is the courtyard on a very good day. Doesn't look like that. <laughs> and this is it. This is when the kids take over. So this is the space where we make our art. We do the workshops. It becomes this public space. And um, this is what we did one day. It took me an hour. It took me an hour to cover the courtyard with white paper. It took five minutes for the kids to fill it up <laughs> with charcoal and with um, with all that um, materials. And then to sort of bring it back to the installation in Chicago is that when we make these installations, we also think about a kind of a domestic convivial space of engagement, because that is how we can transfer information, knowledge through conversation, through conviviality. This was a very, very um, um, important capture at the Chicago Biennial where our neighbors were the Rewak Foundation in the, in the, in the Biennial. And um, we were in conversation around the struggles in Palestine, together with the struggles in South Africa with, with the, the Rewak leaders from the Rewak Foundation. And this I just put in for fun, to inspire the studio that we're doing, Ernest Cole, um, to think about ways of making publication as a kind of a meditative act and a way of um, you know uh, being playful, but also quite intentional, and in how we construct these, these, um, these um, radical, you know, expressions of, of how we can remake publications. Conviviality in acts in a kind of a bigger space and bigger scale where we, for one project, we organized a funeral for a building that no longer is a, a cinema. And in the funeral um, was part of a, a, a arts project where we engaged with um, a uh, funeral um, a band, um, you know, performers, and they basically took the funeral members down the road and performed funeral songs and also music from the jazz, um, the jazz performer that we were paying homage to, called Winston Mankunku. So, in conclusion, and in, and as a way of of um, of concluding and holding all these aspects of our practice, I want to share with you this image of a woman called Katrina Majit. Um, the house that Katrina Majit built in this photograph is about 31 years old this year. Um, Paul Grendon captured her building this house, a ronde house, a round house, um, in a place called Sundrift near Steinkopf and what is today known as the Northern Cape. What we see in this image is her building the house from materials that she gathered from um, around her um, and also her using a physical strength to bend the frames which would later be enshrouded with woven mats. The mats will cover and shield her against harsh sun during the day and cold air at night. But what we also see um, are her belongings and a person, maybe a family member, already inside this construction in process. In other words, she is building around what she already has, with what she has gathered and around what she has gathered. At many traditional architecture schools, we do not learn about this particular intelligence of building. And if we do, it is framed as a tradition of the past rather than a practice of the present. When we learn to make buildings in architecture schools, the traditional curriculum demands that we conceive of the new building as a potential new and empty space, later to be filled with things accumulated over time. The idea of the tabula rasa, the so-called clean slate, still dominates our curriculum. Empty sites, vacant lots, and open land is assumed and often a prerequisite there to fill with new innovative ideas, held together with walls that would divide up service and service spaces. Clarity and order is equated with elegance and sophistication. But here we see the opposite. And I think our practice is constantly in commune with Katrina Majit when we're trying to think about restorative justice, spatial justice, um, repair, um, architecture of consequence, 
and also the beauty of making and, um, our ha and renewing our habits of assembly. Thank you very much. Well, okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it was really beautiful and moving. Thank you very much. Um, in incredible. Um, you said, uh, when I first saw you, you said storytelling. Yeah. Um, and it was not only storytelling, I thought there was this level of intimacy that uh, we rarely find, um, not only in, in the work, but also in your presentation of the work, um, the, the personal to uh, taking us to your, your own house, uh, take, to taking you to your own house, um, to this final image, which I'm incredibly moved by. Um, and it seems to me that that intimacy actually operates across all of the scales of the work, from the, from the school, it was also about sort of intimacy and finding intimate moments to Bessie Head's garden. And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we, just, we can just kind of talk about intimacy for, uh, for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, I think intimacy is something that we shy away from many times because we are so, you know, have to be these kind of people that, you know, perform in particular ways and also intimacy asks that we become vulnerable which we don't always want to do right because we're protective and and all of that but i think i think the time is right for that now i think the time is right to really become um, in commune with what we what we're doing you know because i think that we need to be closer to what we're doing i mean i'm, I'm very also um, reminded of um, somebody like Gyatri Spivak who talks about critical intimacy you know critical intimacy is that Yes, I am critical and I'm a thinking person when I'm thinking about the work, about the discipline, um, but I'm, it, it, it requires a kind of closeness. And that is what I learned when we were doing the work on the, on the factory. Because on the one hand, it has such a terrible history, right? Um, and it has a kind of a very, um, you know, uh, a treacherous, um, you know, brutality towards that kind of architecture and what it's set up. Um, but how can we still, you know, learn from that? And how can we actually take our discipline very seriously, right? Um, and read those spaces in other ways. And I think that is, that is very important in our work, you know, just to think about critical intimacy in the way we read our work and um, thinking about intimacy when we commune with others and, you know, yeah, I mean, I think to, to uh, I mean, for me, I'm just sort of getting my feet back underneath me because I'm so intimately familiar with so many of the places that you showed um, in a very different time. So I, one thing that's related to this question is I'm really interested, I've heard you talk about the, how essential it is to develop um, a, a social imagination. Yeah. Um, as a way of moving forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course. Um, yes, um, I, um, the work that we do is around um, developing a social imagination, but also a collective imagination. Because many of the times we, when we have, um, when we look at the spaces that have been lost, yes, it is the architecture. Yes, it is the roads, the, the, actual, the actual material of these neighborhoods, you know, and my father, was victim of that, you know, he lost his entire neighborhood. There's a parking lot now there. But what's also lost is the kind of, um, you know, imagination or the kind of collective imagination and those networks that form that. So people have been moved all over and these spaces hold a kind of a, um, hold those memories in very particular ways. Um, and the work that we do is also to build, um, a build a kind of a, um, yeah, build a kind of a, a space for, for people to be collective, be collectively free for moments and to be co and, and, and commune collectively and also kind of, you know, like mourn collectively. Um, I know um, somebody like Oran Pamuk talks about Istanbul um, and it kind of the huzun, that, the melancholy that we feel, you know, and I think every space has a kind of a particular feeling, you know, um, and to think through that, um, that emotion and to work through that emotion is, very, very 
very important for the social imagination. So could do, do you, <laughs> so um, to, to tie that to um, we're sort of the beginning of a semester. I guess everyone's kind of involved in research, and we call it sort of research phase of work. Can you talk a little bit about how research operates um, in your practice in relation to the development of, of social imagination? Yes, and um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we. I mean, um, first of all, I don't. Yeah, there's there's research, and there's a kind of gathering of knowledge. Um, but there's also research for the gathering of wisdom, right? So we are interested in gathering wisdoms, um, and that's why we need to be quite intimate with like what we know, how we know, and the ethics that are constructed around that. Um, so we don't get any, like, our practice doesn't get any points for publishing things in journals, for instance, or, you know, um, you know some, of the, some of the kind of typical things that you'd get as a researcher in the academic sphere, right? Um, we we draw on the research to to, to be a, able to act ethically, you know, through our practice, and to, in, to to enable us to to act with informed with a kind of a sense of in, like in, we are informed about what we're doing, and in that way, other things come out of that. It, yeah. But it all it seems that that I mean again the research I, I like the distinction between knowledge and wisdom that you're very careful to make. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but but your work is definitely, I, I mean, it, everybody has to look at the projects that weren't presented to begin to understand sort of the incredible breadth and depth. Um, but it, it, to me, it seems that your practice really ex is exemplary of a, a new form of research, the way that research operates now in this moment of precarity. So it's not this um, kind of a, a, a prelude to the actual project. It is the project. It has agency. It's able. So I'm thinking of um, Ilse, uh, um, Rogoff's writing about. Yeah. Um, is, yeah, I, I can feel that yeah. palpably in yeah. what you you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are engaging with Edith Rogoff's work around, um, you know, how we work today and you know, serious play and all those things. Great. Students are you guys must yeah, <laughs> it's in the syllabus. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so that is definitely a kind of a extension of that thinking. But I would actually argue that these this research methodologies are actually very old. Yeah. And we've forgotten them, you know. Um, for instance, if you look at the work of somebody like Saul Pleike, who pressed flowers when he was doing native life, you know. Um, we are kind of performing those acts again in, and as a homage to his work. Um, somebody like um, Bessie Head basically just wrote about what she was experiencing when she was gardening. So these, these kinds of methodologies of research that it could seem new, but I think um, they're very old. But they're they old traditions of storytelling and of thinking through and, and gathering wisdoms in that way. And like really yeah. questioning, I, mean, like, I like yeah. the, you use the term archive, but you're yeah. really fundamentally saying, yeah. I mean, we think about research as accumulating documents and documents yeah. are things that are written, yeah. but documents, the term really means things that teach. Yeah. And so when you're okay. pressing flowers, you you know, the geology is mm. part of an archive yeah. or the DNA of a plant or, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and knowing some of the, uh, the, the projects and your approach to site, mm. it's um, mm. that, that schism between the kind of preparatory work and then the actual design work sure. does not seem to be active. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, continuing to talk about <clears throat> that difference between sort of knowledge and wisdom. I, when you said that, I was reminded of a, and I'm not gonna remember the full quote, but I, I, I think the students will because I, I put it on things before. Tony Morrison writes about the difference between information, data, and wisdom, exactly. right? And exactly. the, the danger of confusing the three. And it seems to me, for example, with the Bessie head, is that she was actually still speaking to you Oh yeah. Through yeah. through the writing, so it wasn't you weren't extracting something, but yeah. you were listening to yeah. to her, and maybe that's where the transmission, some of the transmission in terms of yeah. wisdom, yeah. sort of occurs. Yeah, I mean, Bessie Head speaks to us, and Katrina Majid through that photograph, you know, um, which is a complete like, um, you know, debunking of the pedagogy actually. 
yeah. if you really take that photograph seriously. You know, and it talks on conceptual ways of how can we make space a, a lot more communal, a lot more, um, you, know, um, you know, yeah, about sustaining relationships. And um, yeah, so, so there's these wisdoms if you, I think one has to learn how to look and learn how to read and learn how to think, you know. Yeah. Um, and it strikes me, I mean, particular with that last image, which I'm so taken by, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that was an, a, uh, I don't want to say a different, but, or an other, mm -hmm. but it was a, yeah, maybe I will we'll use the word different, a different way of knowing mm -hmm. space. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a spatial practice, yeah. but it was a, a way in which the body was engaged in it. You talked about sort of building around yeah. what you have yeah. rather than kind of making something and then filling it yeah. with other things. So there was already a knowledge yeah. about what's needed, yeah. right, to kind of construct or yeah. make uh, yeah. enclosure around. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that knowledge gets passed on, and it's it's part of a leg, it's part of a kind of a tradition, or and yeah, it's part of a history. It has a history as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that strikes me about um, what I think is a, an extraordinary semester. This semester with the Advance mm -hmm. Six Studios is that uh, we're uh, uh, we are are being sort of. Uh, gifted, if you will, by people like yourself and, and you know, the other critics who are kind of bringing this to us that there are these other ways of, of knowing and, 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 and thinking about pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you one question yes. about humor? Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the, the pamphlet, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong in yeah. my sort of absorption of it, it, it to me, you are forcing people to say a word in an, an accent and a dialect that is particular to Cape Town. Oh, yeah. So the word pamphlet, which is linked to pamphlet architecture here, saying it as a pamphlet, pamphlet map, it's spelled that there must be this incredible pleasure hearing people yeah. say the word. Yeah. I mean, I just wrote it the way, um, I just spelled it the way that my collaborator actually would say it, or his uncle actually, um, he used to say, we had, okay, I'll tell you the story about the name of how it came up, but we were working on this publication on, on the history of a cinema, and we had a drink one evening, and his uncle, Opa, was now passed, and he, his uncle is a, um, he educate, he's got a long legacy of having a school in Johannesburg, downtown Johannesburg, where advocate, um, um, uh, sort of activists were, teach, were being taught. So the school is dedicated to teaching yeah. activists and then have a kind of a pedagogy around the methodologies of activists, um, the history of activists and teaching people how to become activists. So he was listening to our project and making a little publication. He said, ah, oh, you guys are pamphleteers. That's what you are, you know. So I just dedicated to that name, pamphleteers, because it is a very particular kind of activism practice, the urgency of getting something out, um, and a very small, modest, um, you know, booklet um, that gets the information in a very urgent way. There's no real kind of thinking about an editorial project, you know. Um, there's no there's mistakes in there. You just scratch out the mistakes. You tape over the mistakes. It's rough. It's Xeroxed, and um, the way he said it was basically how I, how we ended up, yeah, how we ended up um, talking about it. Um, yeah. Maybe before we open it up for sure. questions, um, <clears throat> uh, can you uh, talk a little bit more about the Rhodes Cottage? Ooh, yes. <laughs> um, yes. Because I, uh, the Global Africa Lab, of which I'm co-director along with Mabel Wilson, we were doing work in uh, in Cape Town yes. at the time that got interrupted because of the students' protest and the yeah. and roads must fall and yes. um, maybe I mean what's it like to work on that? I mean, yeah. I, and I'm thinking yeah. humor, irony. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's an absurd space. It's really an absurd, surreal space. And I, I was I never knew about that space um, because it's also quite hidden. It's prominent, but it's hidden, right? So um, they've, they've, the, the, the hysterical society has, um, they've, they've 
succeeded in kind of having this underground but quite mainstream also little shrine for roads. People come from Zimbabwe and Zambia to come and visit it, you know. Um, and, you know, they, they're aware that it's not cool, but they keep going, <laughs> you know. And I think the, Cape, the city of Cape Town have made this kind of um, project available and to, to address it in some ways. But they were also sort of, it was a public tender, you know, we sort of put our name in a, in a box at City of Cape Town and whichever heritage work comes up, then we get a call. It's completely like, we don't have any control of the projects that we get. We can say yes or no. Um, at the time we were very low on work, so we couldn't really choose what we wanted to do. So we got the project in and as we, 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 had, we, we discussed it as, as a team because the archive is incredibly rich, you know, there's so much. And the city of Cape Town is sitting on all this archival stuff. And, um, you know, we produced a very like simple plan because it didn't, you know, it's very well maintained actually, but it is all kinds of issues around safety for the, for the public, for the, um, the city of Cape Town. They own the building, but they have this other system where they can, um, you know, tend it out to a kind of a society to run a museum for five years. So they've got hold of the space for five years. After that, a new organization must come in. Yeah. So there is a space for that to happen over time. But because they've just signed the lease in the next five years, they're going to have to just roll with that. Um, but it's. Yeah, I mean, that's the reality of the situation, you know, that's the reality of our society. At that point, um, a kind of a stubborn cling to like these material, um, material histories um, and a resistance to change. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we should open it up. I'm sure there are lots of questions. I just want to say that I'm proud of a fellow African and a fellow <laughs> South African. Uh, I've grew up with Mandela and Maria Makeba. Now we have Preeti Yende at the Metropolitan Opera and other. Uh, uh, Trevor Noha and I don't know about Elon Musk, but we have good South Africans here, so that's a good thing. <laughs> I, I don't know him. I don't know what you want to talk about. Uh, I have two questions. Number one. I grew up in Africa and Ethiopia, so we don't have any colonial experience uh, in Ethiopia. So I didn't see any uh, colonial you know, uh, architecture or design per se. D do you look at other nations in Africa or in maybe India that were colonized for, for many years and how they were impacted? Maybe Kenya or some other country. Mm. And number two, uh, th there's a Zimbabwean architect, uh, he's probably in his 90s now, but his name is uh, Mick Pierce. Uh, he, he did like biomimicry. He built uh, one in Harare and one in Melbourne, and it mimicked uh, termites, how they build their you know, termite mud. And he tried to save, and he did save about 90% of energy costs, and it was more of a local knowledge that he used, and did you hear anything about him? And I was really yeah, fascinated by Price, what he did, yeah. so if you can say something about that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Maybe another question. You want, okay, I respond to that one? Or can take a few, maybe? Do you want, yeah, just go ahead. So your question is about whether, I, whether we look at other architecture from other African countries? Yeah, I mean, oh. similar situations. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do, yeah, I mean, um, so our, the research, I mean, our work is very embedded in terms of, you know, the place and, and but I think the methodologies we've g g gathered wisdoms from all over, um, so yeah, I, d I don't really know if I'm going to answer your question properly, but, and I have heard of Mick Price, is it Mick Price, right? There's a modern architect, yeah, I have heard of him. Yeah. Maybe we can take another question. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for being Hi. here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, thinking about uh, the notion of reclaiming history, uh, dealing with historical trauma, and how racial oppression are still deeply ingrained, for example, in post-colonial South Africa. 
Can you expand on what you believe the role of architects and architecture should be in advancing towards justice? In advancing what? What was that? What is the last bit of your question? Ah, okay. Uh, can you expand on what you believe the wider role of architects and architecture should be in advancing uh, towards uh, justice? Towards justice, yes. yeah. That's a big question. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer for it, but I think we have to just be keep ourselves very informed. I think we need to just educate ourselves very deeply with the issues, you know, um, because I think I think the the kind of tradition of architectural practice is that um, you know you go in there and you do something, <laughs> you know. So how do we do with um, being attuned to the situation, you know. Um, and I think there, there is a, there's a definite role, you know, like we, we have to practice, we have to keep on going, we have to think, you know, keep on thinking. But um, I think we need to be critical also of the tradition of the way we've acted in the past and the way the discipline has been very complicit with, um, some of, with creating some of these power structures. <laughs> Please don't ask difficult questions. <laughs> oh, here you go. I think one from, from your students. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it was like a very uh, inspiring lecture, first of all. But going back to, that, uh, to, to the previous question, um, you also mentioned restorative justice in the end. And one of the things that I find uh, so powerful like in, in uh, about restorative justice is the role of stories and individual narratives and 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 like the importance of every individual so can you talk a little bit more about uh how the stories the individual stories uh are very are influence i mean can influence you, you know your work uh mm -hmm. because there is, I don't know, like since the very beginning when you say like instead of I'm going to um, like show in some projects is more I'm going to tell you some stories. Mm. So mm. and also how you are always uh, like talking about your, the research, but also how your kids, for example, mm. are part of that, like of your research. So I don't know, like it's a very uh, inspiring so I, I just want to know more about the stories and the role of the okay. architecture like in the future. yeah I mean storytelling is a is a kind of a very ancient technology um, and I think we we need to kind of train ourselves in that technology because it has all kinds of healing um, properties it's got ways of how do we gather you know um, stories have a, a particular power because if you look at the story around Rhodes Cottage there's a big story there that just dominated for no real reason, you know, and people constructed that narrative and it had a spatial implication, a very big spatial implication, both on a kind of a uh, global scale, but also on a scale on this little cottage by the sea and, you know, it, has, it had a major impact. So we need to inform ourselves of other stories and we need to inform ourselves how to, how to create stories that are emancipatory, you know, to think about um, restorative justice and restore some of the things that we lost, you know. Oh. Hi. Do you hear me? Hi. Hi. Um, because your practice is so interdisciplinary, I was wondering how do you keep it open in terms of collaborations? Because I know you work with your husband, right? So mm. I wonder as a future architect after this program, how do you still kind of stay open, stay open to collaborating with other people or other disciplines sure. in that matter? Um, I, I mean, I think we need other people. We are, we definitely, we cannot do this, I can't do this alone, you know. So um, the collaboration with, my, with Heinrich is around <laughs> making a kind of a, a structure for this work to happen, um, being responsible for that structure because as a business we are responsible for, you know, making making sure that people are 
um, you know, um, that we can pay people at the end of the month decent salaries. So we need to be funded. We need to go out and, you know, as much as we construct these buildings, we need to construct connections to, in order to sustain our practice. You know, this is not the kind of a studio where we can just do whatever we want. And that's on the one hand. Um, but and also our practice remains open to kind of people that are doing work that resonates with our work, right? Um, but in other disciplines. So, um, for instance, um, we work with people that are, have a very particular reading of space through music or through um, through conceptual art or through um, writing, you know. So we and through the work that through our own interest, you realize that there are people that are interested in plants in particular ways. There are people that are interested in um, forced removals. There are people that are interested in food, and you make these kinds of connections through a kind of a big project like Bessie Head, for instance, or you know this a project that we're doing in the studio now through Ernest Cole. We're looking at photography in very particular ways. It's interdisciplinary, but how do we make those connections um, that enhance our understanding of space um, in different ways? And I think we need those connections because I think these siloed, discipline, uh, discrete disciplinary is a, is a kind of a fiction, right? It's a kind of a bizarre way that we constructed it for ourselves, you know, um, in a kind of a professional term, you know, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Um, so I, I really loved uh, your story about putting the paper down for an hour um, and then the kids filling it up in five sure, minutes. And sure. it, it really it's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 I think it speaks to, I think, a very common experience mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe taking three or four hours mm -hmm. to cook a meal mm -hmm. for, you know, your yeah. friends and then everyone eats it while it's hot in, you know, 15 minutes or something like that. And yeah. yet that's why we do it, you yeah. know, that's why we, we take that time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's this, this way in which like the work of the design is, t it, it prepares the ground, seeds the grounds for these moments, mm -hmm. but just like in, in cooking a meal mm -hmm. um, or in marking paper, you know, the, like you're gonna have to cook another meal the next day. Sure. Sure. And the next day and the next day. And mm -hmm. so I guess mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of curious about uh, how you see the architecture, the designer's role is in um, kind of repeating the motion yeah. or preparing the ground over and over again. Yeah, and I think that's the work because there's a difference between work that we do, um, uh, you know, as, as a kind of with discrete outcomes and work that we do as ritual or as like, you know, pattern or as a kind of uh, work, um, work as a kind of a devotion, you know, so cooking is a kind of, and Heinrich has, talks a lot about work, um, work as a kind of a do devotion to others. This is his idea around uh, particularly the Baha'i Temple, for instance, you know, that we just um, constructed in the Congo, which I didn't go into, but um, there's a kind of a, you know, a devotional act towards our, um, to, to, what's, towards walk, work that you could go into. Um, but the thing is, I'm saying that it's annoying that the kids did that, but it is a joy to that, you know, there's a kind of a joy that, oh yes, of course, you know, let's just do this thing together. And that is the kind of uh, thing about conviviality. I think it's about how do we, how do we work together in convivial ways where um, maybe yes, today you are setting the ground, but tomorrow you are actually doing the drawing. You know, these things overlap and they change and, you know, um, we learn from each other. You know, we learn from each other. Um, you know, the kids saw me doing the, 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 putting the paper down so they can do it next time, right? Um, and it's a kind of a, a, a very motion, there's a, like a mobility in that kind of work, right? Um, and it's not so discreet, and it goes back to your question around interdisciplinarity, because, you know, these things are not stable, you know. Um, they move and they, they, they interweave in, in interesting ways. So I think we need to think about work differently as well, you know. Um, work as, as, as collective work, right, rather than, you know, um, these kind of individual pursuits. Yeah, it seems to me that that's where the... Um you know, the constructing conviviality, right? Mm -hmm. That, and that it's ongoing, mm -hmm. right? That it doesn't, you know, it's not constructed, mm -hmm. it's constructing, so it's, it's yeah. a continuous process. It's a practice, of I guess is what I would say, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wanted to ask um, regarding this concept or that is throughout your practice of creating these uh, conv convivial spaces, how you approach that in in the component of more like your cur curatorial um, practice, uh, because it was like beautiful to see how how within the an exhibition space, like the what was happening is the same as what's happening in the courtyard, was the same as what's happening in most of the spaces that your practice uh, creates. So, mm -hmm. so there was hap like in in there was happening a conversation. No, so mm -hmm. I um, so I would like to know a little bit more on how you approach the um, yeah the opportunities within the exhibitions and curatorial practices mm -hmm. through the lenses or like what what how you see and what is the meaning that they have for you what opportunities okay. they bring for you to expand on your own uh, mm. approach to everything else you do yeah if it makes sense yeah no it does i mean so you're asking about some of the work that we do like for instance by biennales mm -hmm. and things like that exactly yeah so the, the chicago architecture by biennale was a very particular kind of invitation because Yesome, Sepake and Paolo, they really worked hard to support a project, right? So they didn't ask for, um, you know, an exhibition of work. You know, they wanted to grow something with us. And at the time, I said to them, I'm looking at this Bessie Head's house and, you know, would you be interested? I mean, I don't even, it was a very sketchy thing. So they were like, yes, and there's a, there's a kind of a trust from the curators that comes with with that trusting a process, you know. We didn't know what we were going to put up there, you know. In the end, it was a film, it was a, many things, it's still ongoing. But those kinds of um, invitations are really important for us to develop work, right? To develop, to get the resources, number one, to develop work, to develop our thinking, and to develop a kind of a position, um, and to develop you know, ideas around how we work. So they definitely are important. Not so much, you know, you know, Chicago is a beautiful place, you know, <laughs> um, but it's not, it's not so much being in that very like, you know, uh, uh, glamorous space of Chicago, right? Um, but it's about the support that you get from, from, from curators and from, from people. Cur curatorial work actually means to take care that is the kind of meaning of it, right? How do you take care of somebody's work, somebody's thought process? And they, they, re they really did that. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, since uh, we are thinking about how to, I guess, work in studio convivially, yeah. um, I guess my question, Maybe it goes back a little bit to Lindy, your point about research. I, I feel like there is some um, effortlessly visible way, methodology in which that you're navigating the space between intuition, creativity, and research, and a rigor. Mm. However, I, I think that as um, architects or architecture students these days, it's quite hard to get into that mind space and creating kind of the environment or even sort of a community in which these kind of collabor collaborative work could happen. Mm. So I wonder um, what, what would you say or what, what's, your, what's your opinion in terms of how to create an op uh, a space in which that today's students can actually um, create, um, become this convivial, collaborative, groups in some sense. This is a challenge mm. for us as mm. well uh, this semester. Mm. But I, I, <laughs> I, I wonder what's, um, what's your take on it? I think the habits need to be re-looked at because these are habits, right? These are habits, these are, um, some of them are bad habits that we just need to undo and learn, you know. Um, and I think we need to work together, you know, to think, to, to kind of identify the bad habits or the habits that are not productive anymore, you know, or not kind of pushing work together, not thinking um, what it is, and then just try. And I think we, you know, um, the space of the, the pedagogical space is the space of experimentation, right? Um, and how, how we need to experiment these things, experiment and really be quite intentional with what we, what the desired outcome is. So if the if the provocation is, let's work collectively, let's work um, convivially, um, 
take it seriously, you know. That's the provocation. <laughs> it's not something that I'd like, you know. <laughs> you know, it's it's like a like yeah. It's like you know. I want like normally the the studios would say I'd like a model and a plan, you know, <laughs> and nobody would question that, right? Because you know that's what you do. But this other thing about working convivially, can we take it seriously? Can we take it as a challenge? You know, can we think through together about that? Yeah. Thank you. It's a prerequisite. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I want to follow up to that question actually about creating this convivial space, yeah. whether it be in your home or in the studio mm. or uh, on a larger scale within curatorial work. Mm. Part of the, I think, challenge is that it becomes very, um, I'd say part of the strength is the intimacy, but also the challenge comes from this intimacy because it becomes very centralized upon these individualized relationships, mm. especially if people, as you say, have not developed these habits yet. Um, but also part of the difficulty is that habits have a tendency to um, unravel or we have regressions or we go back to our old ones. So I'm curious when you think of, I, I don't want to say legacy, but when you think of creating this conviviality beyond um, your ins uh, any institution that you're a part of or any type or even beyond your house, like how do you have other people maintain this community outside of that, um, the space that you're personally involved in? Mm. Um, so, so the question is about how does one maintain these uh, convivial relationships? Is that your question? Am I interpreting it correctly? After the after after the studio is finished, or or after the project's finished, I don't I don't actually. Yeah. I maybe you can just clarify. Yeah, how to, I think how to maintain these convivial relationships yeah. over the long term, but also how to ensure that, I think part of the conviviality is also not just when one is involved personally in it, but also mm. among the other um, groups or members of the community, uh, even when one is uh, absent from that group. So I'm curious how those two types of uh, mm. maintenance, once, uh, one in terms of the relationships that you're involved in, but also it's like mm. in terms of community that you might not actively or physically um, be present in? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's so difficult because, you know, you got to just, you got to be quite like, you know, uh, yeah, kind of free that it might not, you know, work in the way that you want it to, but also quite free to just go for it, you know, in the best, in the mm -hmm. most serious way possible, right? And also accept that maybe um, it might not work for everyone. I don't know, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it seems to me there's mm -hmm. something uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, in talking about the, the mm -hmm. Rhodes Cottage, you mm -hmm. said they called you unprofessional, and you said yes. you, sometimes you have to embrace unprofessionalism. Yes. So it, it may be that the expectation is after you mm -hmm. leave this situation that you're going to somehow mm -hmm. then adhere to being quote unquote professional, mm -hmm. but maybe mm -hmm. conviviality is actually not professional sure. or is being unprofessional. Yeah, there's a level of so kind of like, you know, um, unprofessionality or um, intimacy is what you what I maybe think about that within the context of the Rhodes Cottage they were really expecting a very dry document that's going to tell them exactly when they must schedule the paint work on February 2nd 2025 and then they must do that then they must do that you know but how can we do that like without it will just be like bizarre to act in that way and ignore everything else you know it's like the big elephant in the room you're ignoring because you're trying to be professional you know and it's it doesn't work you know it doesn't work it's awkward <laughs> yeah so you have to break the mold sometimes Great. well maybe that was the last question um, Ilza, mm. thank you so much. Thank you, this Mario. Is thank you, Lindy. Thank you.